Okay, let's get going. Who's next? Now, I do a lot of endo for a GP and came out of school with the guilt thing that, you know, you're going to screw something up. <clears throat> and Ben taught me a ton of stuff, but uh, I'm impressed that the, how the endodontist philosophies have changed over things and, and over the years, including uh, access preparation. You know, it used to be like it was, you know, two millimeters here and three, and then now, I'm, you know, if I have to refer something that, that I don't feel comfortable with and I get this thing back and the whole top of the tooth is gone, you know, trying to find this thing. And I understand that access is important. So the thing that gets me is I feel I access according to what I feel comfortable and I can manipulate according to the patient they can open that. Mm -hmm. The thing that gets me is that as a GP that we're doing, I'm doing implants, I'm doing crown and bridge, doing this, you know, you guys are lucky because you got one assistant and you got, you focus on, you've got one set of inventory type of things and we have to have a dental, I mean basically a dental supply. So we're going through there and we know there's a fourth canal there, all right? And we can feel that fourth canal, but yet, do we justify getting the ultrasonics and things to actually work into that? Is there some type of suggestion that, I mean, the thing that I do is I'll, I'll, I may spend, you know, 45 minutes trying to find that thing, or I know it's there getting it open with, you know, taking an 8, cutting it down, but turning it into a 10, and then taking a 10, cutting it, turning it into a 12, and trying to negotiate that. We need to work together. I'd love to grab you one-on-one -on -one and spend an hour on MB2s. I mean, See, I know they're there, but you just, there's, there's, you know, it's either, it's going to, it's going to let you in pretty fast if you can just get to it. But, you know, there's a point where you just can't get to this thing. hope it's, you know, calcified. And you always wonder going, I know it's there, I know it's there. Is there something I could have done to get down it? Okay. So I don't, listen, I, I got to come before you tonight with humility because I'm not an expert and I don't even know why I'm up here asking questions except I was asked to. But I've had, I've made every mistake everybody in the room's made, probably like double. So this isn't the truth up here and it isn't like Leonardo da Vinci hands. But one of the biggest problems with ME2s is knowing where to look for them. And if you're doing a lot of endodontics, which I think you started your statement off with, there's just a few things you could get aboard with your technology that would, could make a difference. And if well, I feel comfortable knowing where they are. Well, and just get if you find them and you know where they are, then I'm going to say you should be getting through them. And the biggest problem is, uh, from this is what I learned teaching. See, teaching I learned way more than I'd ever learn if I just was a four-waller for life. And I've been a four-waller for like almost 30 years. But when you teach and you, you got a little, you know, you got three or four teeth here and he's got three or four teeth, I'm looking at teeth like almost every weekend and I might be looking at 60, 70, or 100 teeth. And when you have the students turn them upside down, say to your, do you do this on your next extraction? Say to the student, well, everybody just put a tin file in the MB2. When you get that done, just hold your tooth up and I'll know you got it. Okay? Well, almost everybody can, you know, they might merge, but oftentimes they're separate about 60% of the time and they can put like a tin file in it, maybe up two or three millimeters. Then I say to the student, now go into the access and take the file that you know will go there because you just demonstrated and take it to length. You never can do that, can you? That means the rate of taper of the file is exceeding the rate of taper of the canal at that moment in time. And the kiss of death is trying to snake instruments, tens, eights, and sixes to length. We've got to manage that triangle because those MB2s come in at really awkward angles. And oftentimes when you start to negotiate them, your file's banging on the outer wall. And if we use ultrasonics, we can peel some of that roof back, and then we can get our tapered diamond, take the whole axial wall back. And all of a sudden, you'll notice if you work a 10, a 15, and a 20, and just let them go in two or three or four millimeters, just feed them in, back them off counterclockwise so they don't go deeper. Clockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise, counterclockwise. All of a sudden, I can get a Gates 1 in there and like do a little bit more work at the coronal orifice level. You take an 8 or a 10 now, those things will usually drop to mid-root. Then if I go 10, 15, 20 again and recap through it, pretty soon you're going to have an, an 8 or a 10 arrive at length. So I want you to have the clear thought. If you can find them coronally, the only thing preventing Ruddle to get to length is Ruddle because I'm usually trying to do it. In the old days, I was trying to use sixes and eights and fight all this coronal curvature. You get that coronal curvature out of there, and then you do some sections on postmortems. Your MB2's got plenty of 
working with along its length. It's just usually coronally because of disease and pathology, our chambers, you know, <clears throat> pinch down, our orifices close down, and then you think of the awkward angles, like think of where your handle on your 10 file is in the MB1. It's usually coming out like this initially, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't even take a 10 file into the middle one third of the root until the handles are standing up straight and tall, because then I have radicular access. So, so there's two kinds, there's coronal and radicular, we need both. And the biggest mistake I see is colleagues not insisting on coronal access and radicular access on MB2s. So they're there, and they're fun to find. You need to have a fee that lets you treat them, because they're not the easiest uh, one in the maxillary molar, are they? No. It's the one we spend the most time on, mm -hmm. and you can spend 20 or 30 minutes just to rule it out. Yeah. And even when I rule it out, I don't think it's not there. It just means I'm human frailties and I can't do it. I just find just frustrating when I know it's there, and then, I, like you say, if I can get two millimeters down it, and then work that two millimeters, work it just to where I can get something two millimeters and still just can't. I mean, sometimes it will just, it'll work its way in there, you know, but you're right. I understand what you're saying is that you can get that orifice open to where you can get something in there. And generally, it, I find, you know, the shorter the file, the, the greater the axial strength on it. So you turn a 10 mm -hmm. into a 20 mm -hmm. and you have access and everything. It's just that. I think if we were together for like one hour, you'd, your, your biggest comment would probably be to one of your colleagues is like, he didn't even try to get to length. And my God, he got to length a lot quicker. Yeah. So I'm not trying to get to length. I'm not even trying to get in the body of those canals. I'm just trying to get the handles upright. I'm trying to do a little flaring in my orifice level, and then you'll find instruments start to move. And if you can find the orifice, I'm, I'm going to say it again. If I can't get to length, it's, it's a ruddle thing. <clears throat> Because if you look at the anatomy, it's available. But I just think it's patience, stay back a little bit, get that access, don't try to run instruments in. A lot of them get blocked early, and then they're finished. I don't want to be discouraging, but uh, what are you using for lighting? But you're finding them. You said you found them, so you don't, that, that's half the battle is to find them. <laughs> Generally, I mean, I find them by feel, and then just, and try to work it, and then just, well, I'm not that good. I have to see them. <laughs> feel it. I'm always trying to feel shit. <laughs> I'm not always so good at it. I have to see it. I need some kind of closure on this. You talked about uh, when do you, uh, how far do you go before you give up? And I've, I've wrestled with that for, for years, you know, and uh, I've had times where I thought, I've given up. And then I'll, I'll go another millimeter and I'll find it. You know, and some of those yeah. MB2s I found mm -hmm. way down the middle third of the, uh, of the root. It's humbling, isn't it? And I think, well, should I be trying harder on these? But I mean, uh, because we don't know the risk buckle wiggle width benefit. of that, and yeah, the mm -hmm. risk benefit, because if you can't see a groove or something to follow, and uh, you know, I, I find myself saying, uh, uh, picking a point below the floor of the pulp chamber and saying, well, that's my limit, and I'm not going to, if I haven't found it by then, I'm going to quit. And there have been other cases where I've, you know, there, it's a failure or a retreatment, and I'm convinced there's got to be something there, and I, I'll, I'll go farther and farther in there and finally find something. I think, well, how about the last 20 cases that uh, I didn't go this deeply and I didn't find anything, and was, did I miss something? You know, but do you have a, your own kind of limit uh, uh, below the floor of the pulp chamber where you say, I'm more convinced that there isn't one here? When I have to change my uniform, <laughs> that's, what, that's when I've gone enough. Uh, no, I mean, if I'm, first well, of like all... like MTA, too, and I use a little bit there when I've gone too far. But, uh, <laughs> I heard that part. Okay, so when are we, when is enough enough and when should we stop and risk versus benefit? Uh, that's not teachable because it depends on skill, knowledge, and training, and then having a little bit of technology aboard certainly helps. But statistically, in my practice, even back from 1980 on, uh, I didn't have a scope till 88. So I was wearing two fives or three fives, and I always was trained to get a headlamp. We were finding 75, 76 percent all through the 70s and the 80s. And, and then when Stropko's paper came out in the JOE, which is the largest uh, study ever done on humans, over 6,000 teeth, he found that 91%, well, first without the scope, he started his, this was several years, so just with glasses and a headlamp, it was about 75 or 76%. And let me be clear, it wasn't a catch. It was a catch, 
He had to negotiate it. He had to reach the terminus. He had to shape the canal. He had to fit a cone, and then he counted that he got an MB2. If he got down part way and couldn't do it, he didn't get an MB2. So that was 75, 76 percent. When he got the scope, as we all know in the endodontic world, it rose up to about 91 percent. <coughs> and then out of those 91 percent, I don't remember exactly, but it was about 60 percent merged and exited as one, and about 40 percent had two or more separate apical portals of exit. So when you know this is a clinical study, and then you in the dots of the room, when have you resected the MB root surgically and not found an MB2 or an interconnector or a big fin off the MB1? They're there like they're ubiquitous. So at some point, you know they're there, so we're trying even harder. But if I'm not comfortable, and at some point I don't feel like I know what I'm doing, I, you know, the old Hippocratic oath, do no harm while doing good. So at some point, if I perf and mutilate the tooth, that's a real disaster, but I still have a, a surgical option. And if we do surgery, you do surgery, that root's pretty, pretty close to the buckle. You can palpate it, it's festooning. Yeah. Now the problem is it's a broad root, so getting across <coughs> that root all the way to the palatal side, staying it with methylene blue and getting the PDL outlined, you know, that can take a little bit more skill and then prepping it and running out the interconnector skill, but uh, they're there. So I just want to encourage you to find them. And go to my website. This isn't self-grandizement, but I'm really proud of my website because I've had my daughters and um, I have a web team and we spent a lot of money and time for the last several years enhancing my website and it's going to change dramatically even in the next six months. But I have a lot of downloadable free PDF articles and you'll probably benefit from the one of calcified, missed, previously missed, or aberrant canals, and I identify 14 ideas to find them. And you probably already know seven, but you're not thinking like that maybe tonight, but you're probably doing a lot of things, rule that out, what's the contingency, fallback position, what do I do next? But there's a lot of ideas to help you find canals, and they're there. And so the trick is, as the years go by, patience and restraint, because I think, again, from teaching, okay, people pay a lot of money to come to Santa Barbara and take <coughs> courses. And they come for all kinds of reasons. But frequently when you ask people, why are you here? They'll tell you, I want to learn how to be warm. Uh, I want to learn how to shape. I want to learn about that wave one. Or what about pro taper? Whatever. But what do they always do, Phyllis, at the instructor station? They stand in line four or five deep, and they're all there to learn how to find MV2s. And what they almost always say on their critiques, on their you know, exit studies, they always say that the benefit of the course was they learned how to find MV2s. So it's just a little drill. It just takes a little bit of discipline and sometimes a different way of thinking about it. Because a lot of times we keep doing the same old thing over and over and the years go by and we're expecting a different result, but we gotta like change how we, we see things. So I want, you seem like you're a good dentist and you wouldn't even be here tonight if you didn't care. You'd be home with your family or doing something else. So I saw the menu. The menu was good. Yeah. Good. Well, Linda said she, beat, she, she said she beat me up if I didn't. I'm, I'm thinking you care a I'm lot, and I'm something. thinking we want you to find more MB2s. And I'm thinking you can. In other words, don't worry about that access. Oh, back to the access. So I'm doing a demo in, at the midwinter meeting in Chicago when I'm at the University of Illinois, and the McCormick Center is like 25 miles away, and they have a Super Bowl truck, and you know it's fun to just do the demo so you can go through the Super Bowl truck. Ed, he would really like this part. He, they said, I said, can I see the truck that they use for the Super Bowl? And it had like, I'm making this up, but it might have had 25 monitors in it. And there was like five guys in it. It's like semi-tractor trailer. Anyway, they beamed this whole show over on a, from a patient over to the McCormick Center, and there's a core audience of about 800 people. So I'm wearing a headset, and I'm working away, and Phyllis is assisting me, and I have a guy that's moderating for me, so if it gets tense and I can't talk because I can't hear, I can't do more than one thing at a time if I'm rattled. So anyway take a little heat off me. So this guy's yelling in my earphone and finally I, I stop and he says, if I made my accesses that big, I could do it too. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, great, great observation. Next question, please. <laughs> but you know, we're so caught up on conservation of tooth structure, which is not to be minimized. And especially below the orifice where we have external root concavities. But really, access is everything. You, you talk to the guys in this room, 
it's like in real estate, it's real estate, location, locate. You can't do anything with shaping, disinfection, operation unless you can get in there and find everything. Well, I do agree with that, and I think that's where we benefit over the endodontist because we're sitting there thinking, you know, 90% of the time we're going to be putting a crown on that thing. Yeah. You know, so an endodontist is not going to, I mean, if something's in my way and I know there's going to be a crown, I know where the margins are going to be and the core is going to be and everything. It's out of the way, mm -hmm. so I can get access to it. Okay. Where the endodontist is going to go, if I cut this away, he's going to go, oh, why'd you cut all this away? That was another big problem in Santa Barbara in the 70s. My accesses were too big. So what I would do is I would take you, you, mm -hmm. and you, and say, would you access three or four teeth, and would you mind coming into the office and we'll have some access drills? <laughs> he doesn't want to do this, so it's the wrong guy. <laughs> would you like to come into the office with three or four teeth? We'll drink some beers. We'll drink heavily. Okay. Oh. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, they come in, and what you find out is they're they're working through a little pee hole, and a lot of times you just take those axial walls back, and they're going, "Wow!" I mean, that's an international expression. Wow. Whoa! I can see. So get it opened up, but then we have to live in your shoes because we know as in the Donis that after we're done, you have to come in there and get the feral effect and do all the mechanical things you need to do. So. I need to understand what you're thinking, and I need to always be sensitive to that. Then hopefully you can maybe see that if, if, if he's finding a lot of MB2s and, and you're not, then maybe you'll give him permission to move, remove a little bit more of the mesial marginal ridge at the expense of the mesial marginal ridge to take the wall back so he can get into that MB2 because that MB2 is never on the imaginary line from the MB1 to the palatal. That's what the textbooks always said, but we were just kidding. <laughs> it's never on that line. Maybe in a second molar. But it's always mesial to that imaginary line. So you find colleagues out where the, the roof meets the floor, and you know, ten, hand, ten, file, ten, ten files later, all crimped over, they're going, I ruled it out. Well, hell, they didn't even get to the orifice yet. They just got to the groove. But the orifice isn't in the groove, most, most often.